میفتن Welcome to For the Record. Today I have with me Congressman Chester G. Atkins from the 5th Middlesex District. Chet, we noticed that lately you've been getting a lot of headlines. I know that you're the chairman of the Massachusetts Democratic Committee, but we've been watching your work on the Ethics Committee and, of course, your successful quest for a seat on the Appropriations Committee. Do you want to tell me a little bit about what you do on those committees? And I'd like to start with the Ethics Committee. Sure. The Ethics Committee is the only committee of Congress that's evenly balanced Republicans and Democrats. There's six Democrats, six Republicans on it. Uh, we've been involved with the ongoing investigation of, of Speaker Wright, and it's been a, a very difficult time. It's been a difficult time for the Congress, I think. It's been a difficult time to be involved in, in something that's just had a tremendous effect on, on the institution and the way people perceive uh, Congress as an institution. I, I hope that we're able to, um, to get that, that matter resolved quickly so that the Congress can move on to, to important business. I'm afraid that that's to some extent slowed down the work, of, the work of the Congress. On the Appropriations Committee, I serve in two subcommittees. One is the uh, Veterans Administration, HUD, and independent agencies, the subcommittee. We have, in addition to the VA and HUD, we also have jurisdiction over the National Science Foundation, the mm -hmm. NASA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and that's been a, a very challenging position. I've been focusing my energies on three areas. One is in HUD, trying to do some things to restore order uh, to our public housing projects, particularly to be able to uh, begin to control them and control the drug traffic in public housing. And the second thing I've been involved with is the area in, on the National Science Foundation uh, trying to promote more efforts for a teaching of science, trying to improve the quality and getting money in and a heavy emphasis on, on science and bringing along new generations of scientists. Particularly, there's a real concern that we're not having the kind of numbers of women um, going into science that we that we really need, and and the final area is in um, in the Environmental Protection Agency. I've been working on trying to get money uh, for Boston Harbor and for the cleanup of Boston Harbor, and also trying to push very hard to get the cost of that cleanup down. Uh, I think that a number of the proposals that the court and the Mass Water Resources Authority are are making are just absurd. That they're unrelated to you know, really getting the harbor clean and they just um, have a kind of a blank check mentality and people throw around a billion dollars and a thing increases a billion dollars overnight and nobody thinks about it. It's going to be an enormous, enormous burden on, on people in Massachusetts, not just in the Mass Water Resources Authority service area, but the entire state. Well, those are two of the things now that have been hitting close to home. You work with HUD. Do I understand yeah. that you were instrumental in making it a little bit easier for uh, our law enforcement people to deal with public housing? Well, particularly to when Secretary Kemp came before our committee, I pushed very hard to get some rules expedited uh, so that they can, um, so public housing authorities can evict people who are causing trouble, particularly people who are actively involved in drug trafficking in, in public housing. It's, you talk to some of these mothers who are raising young children. Yes. They're fearful of even having their children step outside. And you, you ask yourself the tremendous, tremendous challenge of raising a child under those circumstances, a single mother, and then to add to that the crime that's swirling around the, you know, the entire housing complex and, and how they deal with that, how they deal with a situation that virtually um, the only men who are doing well financially in, in that area are people who are involved in the drug trade. And it, it's something that really has to change, and, and it ought to be a top priority of the government to get these parasites out of uh, public housing in every way that, that we can. And the other uh, subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee that I serve on is the Interior Subcommittee. And we have jurisdiction over the Department of Interior, the um, National Forest, the National Parks, um, all of all of the activities for support of the 
Arts and the Humanities, National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities. One of the projects here locally that I've been very, very involved with is Scenic Rivers Project. Project already the National, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has purchased a large portion of the wetlands for the Sudbury and the Concord Rivers, and we really need to protect those rivers. And I think we need a, a major effort to protect the remaining open space in this area. If we don't, we're going to irrevocably change the character of the communities that it's really, I think, the reason that most of us live, choose to live here. Now, this involves the Sudbury, the Concord, and the Assabet Rivers? Right, the whole watershed. And what we're hoping to do is get a scenic river designation, which will give us an extra leverage on um, getting some money for open space acquisitions. The other thing that it will do is prohibit the Mass Water Resources Authority from tapping that water as a future source for, for Greater Boston. And the real challenge for us, I think, is water conservation. I've been yeah. very, very involved with this effort. It sounds kind of humorous, but for a 1.6 gallon low flow toilets, we have the technology for those. 40% of the water that people consume in their homes uh, goes literally down the toilet, and it's absolutely mm -hmm. unnecessary. It's a waste. We're you consuming in Massachusetts on a per capita basis almost twice as much water as we were at the end of World War II, and it's not that we're cleaner or we smell better or anything. It's simply that we have more appliances that waste more water, and, and people don't even assume that it's a, it's a real cost. And with the water rates going up, it's, it's going to be a situation where many families will pay upwards of $2,000 a year in their water and sewer bills. Absolutely incredible. And we've got to do something to cut back on the consumption. Well, I guess Boston particularly has been suffering from that kind of thing, isn't it? Just recently now that you had a sewer bill based on how much water came into the house. Sure. Well, well that's, that was relatively new. Yeah, that's, that's a new, um, a new mm -hmm. system. But the, the point is, is that it's going to cost billions of dollars for us for new water mm -hmm. and sewer capacity. And the key is to cut down on our use, to cut down on that need for new capacity. And that means conservation. It's good for the environment. It's good for the Sudbury River. It's good for people's pocketbooks. These low-flow toilets, the average household in Sudbury uh, would save on a low-flow toilet if you're on the, um, the public water system other than uh, on, your, on your own well, yeah. uh, would save a person $80 a year just by installing that in, in your water bills alone. Now, in your particular district, you really have a wide spread of your constituents. We sure do. Now, one of the things that uh, interests me a little bit is that Massachusetts is one of the states that's pretty well up there, around fourth on uh, defense dollars being mm -hmm. poured into our state. Well, actually, on a per capita basis, we're, mm -hmm. we're number one. We're fourth is that right? Overall. We are one? Yeah. So some of the things that you do now must be involved in the defense budget, too. Well, and the, an enormous amount of of what I do and, and one of the things that I'm committed to is notwithstanding the, the mm -hmm. dependence that our economy has on defense spending, uh, I have an obligation that's larger than to pr any particular industry or business and that is to get that budget deficit down and that's, that's the absolute bottom line vital element for every household and for every business in this district is to get the budget deficit down. One of the key ways we can do that is to have some frugality and have some limits in our defense spending. And I think we're seeing a situation where that um, defense spending is, is coming down uh, slowly, not as fast as I would like, but it is starting to come down. Now, within that, we've got our companies that have to be competitive. There's still going to be a large defense sector, no matter how much we, we cut mm -hmm. sure. out of it realistically. And our companies are, you know, are ones that First of all, we have to assure that they have a level playing field. Massachusetts has such a dominance in so many areas of technology. Other parts of the country that are trying to build a high-tech sector are, are out there, and their idea is they put a little phrase in an appropriations bill, and all of a sudden the Massachusetts company that may have been providing the product or the service for 10 or 20 years and providing it very well is all of a sudden excluded. Uh, from bidding on, on that particular contract. And no, so we have to assure design. that that, by design, uh -huh. absolutely, uh -huh. moves to Alabama or to Texas uh -huh. or to California or to Mississippi or whatever. And we have to be very, very careful of that. Uh, that's, that's one item. 
the, the second item is uh, the important thing in assuring that, you know, that the systems that, that we have where people have a legitimate claim, you know, perfect example is Raytheon. Raytheon produces an absolutely top quality product very, very efficiently. And, and interesting enough, Raytheon is virtually the only major defense contractor in the country that hasn't had a single breath of scandal in terms of their procurement practices or anything. I mean, all of the other big ones have, have mm -hmm. had problems. Now, Raytheon has the uh, Patriot missile system, which turns mm -hmm. out to be a critical system uh, as you remove nuclear warheads. The Patriot mm -hmm. system is a non-nuclear system. Uh, there are people in other areas, um, other countries who are trying to basically get American support uh, to duplicate the Patriot system, which is absolutely nuts. The Star Wars, the STI, is involved in some of the things that they're doing and duplicating and at a very high expense um, what Patriot already does. And as we cut back on these things, fortunately, a lot of our companies are showing us ways not just to spend more in defense, but ways that we can get more defense bang for the buck. Well, it sounded to me like the line item veto was a good idea, and yet I understand that you're not totally in favor of it. No, I think, I think the line item veto would be a, a terrible mistake. And, and the reason I think it would be such a mistake is because uh, presently what you have is a situation where the executive uh, submits and the president submits his budget, and essentially strips that budget of most of the particular projects. And these are not pork barrel things. These are vital things, and whether it's the support for uh, the Great Meadows Refuge here or mm -hmm. land acquisition in the Great Meadows or uh, whether it's uh, programs for the national parks uh, or whatever. And then the Congress and the appropriations process winds up putting those things back. And it's a little bit of a game. I mean, the president mm -hmm. knows that those are items that are important to local constituencies. The people at the Office of Management and Budget that put together the president's budget know that if they leave those projects out, then the congressman will add them back mm -hmm. in. And so you have this little bit of a tug of war. And what you would do if you had a line item veto is you would create a situation that you would put a tremendous amount of additional power uh, to the executive so you're changing and you take it away. Well, you change all kinds mm -hmm. of balances. For instance, yeah. what that would do is it would tip the spending priorities, particularly in election years, to the large electoral vote states, places mm -hmm. like California, right. New York, mm -hmm. Texas, and tip it away from a place like Massachusetts. Now, do we need more review on a line item basis of spending? Absolutely. Uh, I would recommend a, a situation where the president could pull out uh, items that the president didn't like in the budget mm -hmm. and force Congress to re-vote on them so that they weren't hidden um, mm -hmm. in a larger maze of projects. But frankly, the biggest pork barrel disgrace of this decade has been uh, the cost of the contra aid policy on the part of the Reagan administration because what happened is you had Republican and some Democratic members of Congress all over the country who were on the fence, who would vote one way and contrade one time, another way, another mm -hmm. time. This and the president very would very call them down way. to the White House, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there was a project here and a project there, things that really were genuinely pork barrel that couldn't withstand the light of day. And, you know, I think a line item veto would just simply exacerbate that kind of thing because the president would have that power and the Congress wouldn't have any power to stop it or to reallocate those projects or even to get to the bargaining table on that. The contra aid policy literally cost us billions of dollars in terms of the projects that were not necessary, that President Reagan, notwithstanding his, you know, all of his talks in the federal budget, handed out to people in order to win their support for contra aid. Well, I think this is what troubles a lot of us about the federal budget, is when we hear that you're going to spend less money in one corner, instead of letting us keep our money in that case, the money is taken from that corner and put into another corner so that we never seem to get back to where there's a reduction in the budget. Do you think our chances well, are better for that? Well, you know, 
people look at that. If you look at where the real increase is, in, in point of fact, for domestic spending, for environmental protection, um, for nutrition programs, for support for education, for support for scientific research, so on and so forth, that money relative to inflation has decreased substantially in the last 10 years. Defense spending has more than doubled. Um, and spending for so-called entitlements, Medicare, Social Security, uh, mostly for our seniors, has increased dramatically as well. Now, why is Medicare and, and Social Security increasing so much? Well, part of that is people are living longer, they're sicker, they're requiring more medical care at the end of their lives, and you're also having more people in that category, the fastest growing group in the population is people over 80. That's over where 80. the real boom is. There's not a baby boom, there's a senior boom, um, which, you know, these are people who wouldn't have lived this long, uh, lived that long uh, in, in previous decades. That's something we should be very proud of, but it's also something that turns out to be extremely expensive. And we also have to look at the fact that we're paying for things that we didn't do before. You know, it's cheap just to foul your own nest um, mm -hmm. and expect your kids to pay for it. I was talking to my 11-year-old son yesterday, and, and his thing is, he said, Dad, you know, your generation is, is polluting the environment and doing all these things. And I said, you know, we kids are going to have to have to pay the cost of that. And I say, whatever happens now, we ought to be paying the cost of that cleanup today and not expecting to, you know, to wink um, and blink yes, and give yes. a nod to global warming and then expect that my son's generation is going to pay the enormous uh, environmental and other costs of, of having a world with a temperature that's three or four degrees higher. Well, I guess I'm one of the folks who feels that that's just what happened to us with the Social Security program. They started it, what, back in 1933, mm -hmm. and the bills didn't come due really until, what, the last 10, 15 years for this generation. So I guess I'm a, I'm a pay-as-you-go well, type of person, yeah. too. Actually, actually, in Social Security, we're starting to, to do that. I, I understand what you mean. The costs, of course, yeah. in starting that program up are, from it are enormous. And, and it was yeah. part of what we needed to get us out of the Depression. Yeah. Yes. But mm -hmm. what you see now is we're, in fact, accumulating a significant surplus every year, about a $30 billion surplus mm -hmm. in the Social Security accounts to pay for the sort of baby boom generation when, when they collect Social Security. And the, the critical fact is that, unfortunately, we're calculating that as a deficit reduction, even though it's in the Social Security Trust Fund. And our budget would be $30 billion more in deficit if they, weren't using um, if they didn't use sort of the Social Security the system. So we are, in mm -hmm. fact, our folks who are working today are, are generating a significant surplus into the fund in anticipation of the fact that 20 years from now, when these people retire, there's going to be a larger number retiring, a bigger drain in the system, yes. and a smaller number of young people coming, coming along and, and entering the, the workforce. And one of the things I think we ought to do is encourage people to work longer. You know, presently under Social Security, if you want to work, uh, and you're on Social Security, there are terrible, terrible penalties for yes. you. And that makes no sense whatsoever. Well, I know they've changed that from time to time. A lot they've of upped the it a little bit, a but, little bit but, but the ceiling is still, um, it's yeah. a very, very low ceiling. I mean, it's hard not to bump your head on that ceiling. Yeah, and I agree. Why are you discouraging somebody from being mm. productive? You know, and in so, in so many on areas, yes. on Social Security and some of our disability programs, that even though the tax code under President Reagan did things to reduce the level of taxation of people and encourage them to work more, our other programs actively discourage people. And we ought to, I think, rewrite all of our formulas and say as a basic tenet, we want to give people every single encouragement we can to have them work. Part of the Social Security program pays for Social Security disability. A lot of people, for instance, who are mentally retarded or on that Social Security disability they go into a workshop, they make more than, you know, a very, very small amount a month, and they're kicked off of yes. their Social Security supplements and then kicked off of their coverage for medical care, which is just nuts. And I can't tell you how many times in my office 
we have to deal with these workshops and so forth coming back and they have to tell these um, you know young adults and, and sometimes they're, they're older um, from these halfway houses and you know sheltered workshops and so forth they can't work as much and that's just craziness. Well, it's encouraging for me to hear your feeling about this, being a yeah. person myself who believes very much in individual yeah. achievement, and that's why I guess I keep saying, stop taxing me to death and let me keep yeah. the money that I make and maybe I can take care but of you know, for, my own for the problems. last 10 years, that was the, the sort of the Reagan philosophy, and we had enormous yeah. tax cuts, but we didn't take out mm -hmm. the disincentives for yes, the handicapped, for the elderly, um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, for single mothers trying to trying to raise children, that's the group that we should have given the incentives mm -hmm. to in the first place. Um, sure. And and I'm working very hard mm -hmm. on legislation now, which will do that in the Congress. But mm -hmm. I uh, I would hope that we could do it and and really restore uh, our national work ethic. You know, if there's, mm -hmm. if there's one single thing yeah. that's uh, a poignant reminder of how this country has changed is just. A sense of work ethic and how that's changed in the last 20 or 30 years. Now, when you say changed, which direction are you talking it's about? Gotten it's gotten worse. I mean, there isn't the, yeah. the kind of, on, yeah. on the one hand, it's gotten worse overall for the population. On the other hand, mm -hmm. there's a larger percentage of the population working, and a lot of people um, are working two and, and three jobs. A husband and wife are working, and they don't have the time to spend with the kids mm -hmm. uh, because they're having to work so hard just simply to, to stay afloat. Well, I've, I've had that experience. Yeah, <laughs> you've seen sure that. You know. you've seen and that. Uh, the incentives for the handicapped, of course, is also something very close to my heart. I grew up mm -hmm. with a sister who's totally blind, and her husband is blind, and yet mm -hmm. they have been self-supporting all of their lives. So I'd like to point mm -hmm. to them and say if they can do it, I guess That's a lot great. of other people can do it too. But they need the support so, to, and the encouragement. They needed and the, the uh, help, and they also yeah. needed the change in people's attitudes to yeah. what they can do and what they can't do. Dis yeah. Discrimination is, you, you don't feel it unless you're... Unless you're part unless of it. Unless you're right. unless part you know. of it or have a family member, yes. you realize yeah. the kind That's of subtle true. discrimination mm -hmm. uh, that occurs and how hard it is for somebody, mm -hmm. uh, say, who's blind to make you know, to, to make a good living and a living yeah, commensurate yeah. with their intelligence. One of the things that's exciting, and most of it's happened right here in Massachusetts, is some of the new technology and new computer technology, which has really empowered people mm -hmm. to be able to work. And we started a program that I've been a strong supporter of that gives very small grants to people for mm -hmm. pieces of technology that will enable them uh, to work. And mm -hmm. the program's been a tremendous success. People go into the workforce, they're you know, really first-rate employees, yes, they are. and they wind up, instead of receiving government assistance, they wind up paying substantial amounts of taxes. Well, do you think part of what we're going through is the, uh, the Depression era thinking on the work ethic and in getting people out of the workplace as they got older in order to let younger people come in? And it's outmoded now. I mean, we just don't have that there's situation. No, there's no question about that, and, and work is very different. You know, it... it um, you know, that people live a lot longer yes, after they healthier. retire at 65. Mm -hmm. They're yes. a lot healthier. Uh, the nature of work isn't as physically demanding mm -hmm. as it was for the most part. Some work is. And I think the key is choices. That, that mm -hmm. people, and, and I think what we ought to be doing in the government, is not forcing people to work longer, but rather giving people mm -hmm. options and choices mm -hmm. and letting them make the decision, but not having uh, rules and regulations and laws which penalize people if they do make the choice to, to work longer or to work on a part-time basis mm -hmm. after they right. retire or whatever. Well, I guess I'm a deregulation advocate uh, in many areas because it seems to me that it has made it harder for the smaller businessman now to get started. Than oh, there's, the... there's no question. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a much, much harder thing today to, uh, to start a small business. And that, I mean, you just look at the level of environmental regulation. It's enormous. Mm -hmm. And yes. On the one hand, on the other hand, and while I'm very sympathetic to the, the deregulatory instinct, you also have to realize, and I spent this morning out in Groton, uh, a small uh, company that decided that uh, they were going to go out and, um, you know, and dump their toxic waste uh, to save a little bit of money to dump their toxic waste oh, in the yes. nearby yeah. stream. Uh, you've got to regulate that kind of, of thing. I mean, and we, we live in a world and in a society that's mm -hmm. more and more interdependent. 
And my mistake, uh, particularly environmental mistake or corner cutting, didn't just cost me. It cost everybody who's downstream. Well, didn't they used to make downwind the comment or whatever that uh, whoever dumped ought to be made to drink the water downstream from where they're dumping? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they'd uh, they'd win in a hurry. What that was all yeah. about. Let me back you up to the health situation again, if I might. It came as a big surprise to me to learn that all hospitals are not made to take care of a sick person that comes to their door. And some I thought was, well, if that's true, why are hospitals tax exempt? I thought that was the, the deal, so to speak. You're tax exempt because you must treat anybody yeah. who comes and is unable to pay. Well, uh, hospitals now, if, if they receive federal funding of various kinds in terms of grants for construction, they're required to, mm -hmm. to treat people. And the hospitals really are, are pretty good about that. Um, the, the barriers come as hospitals have an enormous amount of bad debt and just mm -hmm. financially can't, can't support it. And part of the problem is, is that some hospitals have a pattern of dumping patients mm -hmm. onto other hospitals that they know are very willing to take uh, people who don't have financial resources. Okay, so it's a matter then if there's any federal funding involved. The in hustle, the construction or, or funding. Or city or state, or uh, maybe there isn't any city or state funding involved. Usually in there isn't city things. or state funding. Okay. Uh, that's more funding. But okay. um, uh, the real key is that we have to go to some kind of system, probably something similar to the Canadian system, that, that gives mm -hmm. people coverage and that does it in a way that doesn't mm -hmm. destroy small businesses. Um, mm -hmm. and, and also, and at the same time, begins to control uh, the medical mm -hmm. costs uh, for people. You, you've got to, there have got to be some limits to, to what yeah. we pay and I admit to being horrified if controls. I go in and suddenly I have a $50 bill for mm -hmm. somebody to tell me I'm perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to hear that I'm perfectly okay, yeah. but did, you know, was it really so a little worse after you got a $50 the bill, bill uh, yeah. for this? Uh, <clears throat> the, the problem there, and it's, it's with all of us, and it's a matter mm -hmm. of, of human nature really, is that uh, when you're sick or you have a parent or a child that's sick, you don't care about the cost. Mm -hmm. You want yes. the absolute best care. Uh, and you don't want to know that, you know, there's only a one in a hundred chance that you'll find something in a particular diagnostic mm -hmm. te test that may be very expensive. You want the test done. And yes. so all of us have, you know, while, you know, rhetorically and, and intellectually we want uh, cost control, when it comes down to our care, that comes mm -hmm. at the bottom of our list of priorities. Our first priority is to have the absolute best care. Yeah, well, it's like the firefighter who's a hero when the fire's going on. Yeah. And when but the when fire is out, then you want to know how come <coughs> they're sitting around the firehouse all day, you know, yeah. all day long, I'm sure. Have you been involved at all in the uh, base closings that have come up? I understand there's been a little fun with that. Well, I supported, as you know, the, the base closure legislation. I think they did a good job. I don't think they went as far as they perhaps could have, but it's going to save us a substantial amount of money. Do you want to explain um, it just a little bit to people who may not be Well, what, what's happened is for years uh, the military have had bases that they knew they could close, that they knew didn't make any sense anymore, and, and they wouldn't close them because of political opposition. And you, you couldn't you couldn't get these facilities closed. So what we did is we said we'll set up a commission, uh, eminent citizens. They will review all of the bases, put together a list. They will file the list as one entity. You'll vote up or down on the list itself. And that system worked very very well. I was fortunate. It was a roll of the dice for me because uh, Fort Devens, of course, has been on the list for. Mm -hmm for base closures and a number of times I felt that it was politically motivated that the Devons mission was a very important one but um, notwithstanding that it could have easily been shut uh, mm -hmm. under the provision and fortunately I, I lucked out in that and people when they looked at it when they looked at the what is being done at Devons and the management and the efficiency of scale they decided that it made sense to expand uh, Devons and to put in essentially the computer uh, procurement authority for um, for the army all there in Devons it's going to be a couple of thousand new civilian jobs and it's going to be particularly important for some of our computer industry in terms of the kind of spin-offs 
uh, from that, and it's going to save money at the same time. Now, right now, the people at Fort Huachuca in Arizona who are losing that uh, are fighting, and they'll be trying to do something in the appropriations bill, and I'm going to have to try and fight against that. Chad, in the uh the little time we have left, do you think you might want to tell our folks what are some of the constituent services that your office has to offer them? Well, what we try to do is, is to be the human face for the federal government, that people have so many little aggravations about things and they don't know where to go. They don't know where they can get a, a sympathetic ear uh, for something. And we have a number of constituent case workers who will specialize in whether it's a social security or uh, the Internal Revenue Service or, you know, uh, federal housing programs or veterans programs or whatever. And we try to try to do the best we can for people, whether it's a passport application that's been held up or whatever. I guess you had a problem a little while ago. Yeah. The Internal Revenue Service billed you for zero, zero, point zero, zero, zero dollars <laughs> and told yes, you you're in did. big trouble if you didn't pay. Now, I would have made him out a check for no dollars and no cents, but uh, Julia Blatt, who's uh, from Sudbury, who, who does that work for us in the office, told me that the IRS really doesn't have a big sense of humor, and you're probably wise not to, um, yes. not to do that. And I guess things got resolved. Yes, your office uh, took very good but care of it for it, the you office. Know, it took it, a little while to it, get the whole it thing does. together, it, but it, they did It do takes it time, but the, the important thing for us is we're there, we'll answer mm -hmm. people's phones, um, phone calls and and we'll give a shot we can't always resolve it we can't ever do it as quickly as people would like but at least they have a sense that there's somebody they know there's a face that they can put um, with a thing and our job is really the almost the consumer service mm -hmm. representatives for the federal government and the bureaucracy people quite often do some very stupid things. Well, I had no problem with having patience for it to get through the bureaucratic yeah. maze. I was yeah. just happy to have it get through. Get done, yeah. Well, thank you, Congressman Chet Atkins. It's been great talking to you, learning a lot about the kinds of things you do. I wish that we had a little more time to talk to you about some of the other things that have come up that involve your constituents. Well, I hope we can do it again. I hope we will, too. Everything you've heard today has been for the record.